there you go. And as you all should know, is that Tenet Talk is a production of the Atana Whisperer, Rudy Weideman, K7RAW, and it is supported and sponsored by the Las Vegas Radio Amateur Club here in Las Vegas. So on that note, we're going to just go ahead and jump ahead because I see most everybody who's going to be coming has come in and any stragglers, well, they get to do their own thing. So at this point in time, I am going to turn the activity over to Mr. Weideman, and I will spotlight him as soon as I can get the buttons to work here. And there he is. So, uh, Rudy, I'm going to stop my share, and you can bring yours in at any time or just leave yourself on the screen to self-introduce yourself. Go ahead, Mr. Weideman. K7RAW, the screen is yours. All right. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me uh, let me fire up this. Um, let's see, the sharing. Uh, try to and uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can everybody see that? Rudy, you have the application shared. You need to go to. Uh, okay. You need to click your um, yep. Let presentation. Me, um, kick Just, that into slideshow mode. There you go. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Charlie. Okay. So, um, and and I'm actually seeing what you're seeing on a separate tablet here. So uh, I know what you. I know if you're seeing it or not. So I think we can move forward. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to the first uh, inaugural Q and A on the uh, Tenet Talk podcast. Uh, of course, I'm Rudy Wiedemann, the Antenna Whisperer, K7 RAW. R stands for Rudy, AW stands for Antenna Whisperer. Well, not really, it's my initials, but it works. <laughs> so I can't complain. Anyway, um, so good. Uh, this is going to be fun. Um, so I wanted to, uh, uh, and, and Charlie has already pointed this out, but before we get started, I wanted to point out something about this whole process. Uh, the We put the video up on YouTube ahead of time so that you can watch it. And then the separate Q&A so we can focus on your questions and get clarification, answer questions, solve problems, and really kind of have more time to get into it than just maybe 15, 20 minutes that you'd normally have at the tail end of a presentation. So we, that's why we broke it in half. I encourage you to think of this whole process as a buffet, all right? I'm the chef. I've cooked up some stuff that's just the first round. And um, sample what you want. You can, of course, always come back to the YouTube podcast and uh, pick up what you didn't. There's going to be stuff that you'll get. There'll be stuff you don't get. Don't worry about it. Uh, sample what, what works, what, what tastes good, what you can digest. Uh, and then try new stuff next time you come back. Not a problem. Uh, I'll try to bring, do my best to bring everybody up to speed uh, I'll try to keep, I won't dumb it down, but I'll try to keep it very digestible. All right. Um, but I want to give you some really good insight. That's the really the key thing. I want to give everybody a deeper fundamental insight of what's really going on with antennas. So uh, let's go back. Let's, so with that said, um, I'm just going to now open it up to, uh, to questions. So uh, Charlie's going to handle the questions. He's going to field the questions, and I'll let him tell you how that works. Go ahead, Charlie. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, yeah, if everybody is familiar with chat and Zoom, that is the preferable area that I would like you to put your question in. Or if you are familiar with the reactions in Zoom, there is a raise hand in reactions, and I will see that raised hand um, if you want to uh, use your microphone and give the uh, a question verbally to Rudy. So at that point in time, go ahead with your questions. <laughs> David has risen his hand. So David, go ahead and come off of uh, mute and uh, make your uh, question, please, to Rudy. Hi, guys. Um, I was really impressed with the video. I learned a lot. And then I realized I, uh, how much more I need to learn. Uh, I have one question. Um, Rudy, can you explain Q or is it Q factor? 
Um, and can you explain it in terms of the bathtub sloshing, if it, it's uh, uh, if it's that simple to understand? Okay, great question, David. Thank you. Uh, so you're talking about uh, Q factor of a tuned circuit, correct? I believe so. I guess I don't know what I don't know. Is there okay. a different? So, is there more than one answer to a Q factor? Well, it it has several different uh, uh, aspects to it, David. It's used in a number of different places, but it basically means the sharpness of tuning. Okay, and it's typically the bandwidth defined by some uh, SWR figure could be an SWR of 2.0. The bandwidth that it's resonant or reasonably resonant of 2.0 or less divided by that frequency, okay? So there's, there's, a, there's one measurement of Q. And it, um, if it's, so if it's a wide bandwidth, it's a low Q. If it's a high bandwidth, all right, it is, uh, no, it, I got it the other way around. If it's a high bandwidth, it's, uh, it's going to be, uh, I, I'm trying to, hang on a second, I'm trying to not get you screwed up here. Um, a, a very, <clears throat> a, mag, a mag loop has a very high Q, all right, has a very narrow bandwidth. So it's actually the frequency, the center frequency divided by the bandwidth. Okay, so I always go to an example to get me uh, uh, straightened out. Um, so something that has very sharp uh, tuning, okay, is going to be divided by a small bandwidth, all right? And you'll find that the Q value of most antennas will go up. In other words, the bandwidth will narrow as the frequency goes down. So does that help? Uh, yes, it does. Can you can you apply it somewhere um, in the basic foundation that that would that would help me get an example of it? Okay. Um, so if you're looking at a let's just say you've got a multiband antenna that runs from forty through ten meters. Okay, the bandwidth up at ten meters is likely to be very wide. The bandwidth for that same less than 2.0 SWR is likely to be very narrow in 40 meters. Okay, so the the Q at 40 meters for that same antenna, call it an end fed half wave, off center fed, a uh, trap uh, dipole, that any multi band antenna, that same antenna will have a much higher Q. Okay, at the 40 meter low frequency end than it will at the high frequency end. You've probably seen this before. You probably noticed that on 10 meters, you can tune an antenna pretty easily across you know, half a megahertz or more. Whereas at 40 meters, you're lucky to get you know, more than 150, 200 kilohertz. Mm. Uh, and probably very often less than that. Does that make sense, David? I think so. so it would you see that on a nano VNA as, as a sharp drop rather than a round? Exactly. Curve? Yeah, okay. Exactly. The V is much more narrow and much sharper, a okay. notch, a very notchy as opposed to a broad uh, U-shaped valley. Okay. Thank so you. When it's really narrow notchy, it's, it's a high Q. It's a very, very finely tuned uh, uh, resonance. And they use that in receive circuits. It's, See, the whole thing about it is you use it to advantage in certain places and disadvantage in other places, David. And so you'll see Q value being used, uh, for example, in the tunability and selectivity of a circuit in terms of a bandpass filter. Uh, it'll, if it has a very high Q, then it's very, very narrow in terms of its acceptance range. Okay, so there's another example. And it's, so it doesn't just apply to uh, uh, antennas, but any tuned uh, system. Even shock absorbers have a Q. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Rudy, we've got another question uh, that came in through chat from Mike on KJ7 uh, GLG. And um, I'm going to I'm going to say it the way you wrote it, but it, you may remember this from your presentation. When you get the um, I ohms, say the 
2400 versus 50 in the coax in your presentation does this cause a high heat situation and if if mike can clarify that a little bit that'd be okay mike go ahead yeah go ahead mike yeah i was just curious when when you had your uh showing the different wavelengths or uh, resonance values you, you had a 2400 ohm on the end fed dipole yeah, you know, if you turn into a 50 ohm uh, coax, I know you got a Balin or something else going in the middle. You're going to talk about in the future. Yeah, let hang hang on a second, Mike. Let me bring let me bring up that slide. I've got it sitting here. Let me bring up that slide for everybody's benefit. So we are all on the same sheet of music. Let me stop sharing that app. Let me share this other app. I've got the page up already. You're talking about this slide, right, Mike? Yes, sir. On the left side there where you've got your 2450 ohms. Yep. Okay. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on this. This looks very complicated, but it kind of goes back to oh, that. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, let me uh, <laughs> let me shut down the, the audio on this. Okay. So it's trying to talk to you. Um, okay. So we're talking about, let me... Let me turn on, I think I can turn on the pointer. Hang on. All right, here's the laser pointer. Oops. Stand by. Little technical challenges here. Now let's take a look at the classic antenna system. No, let's, let's, let's not look at the classic yeah. antenna system. Okay, Rudy, if you wanted to turn off the sound, you'd go to slideshow in the, in the maroon banner and click audio off. Okay, let me do that. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie's my technical expert here. So it's nice to see a, uh, a Rudy rookie at work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm still, uh, it's all coming together live here. Where's this uh, turn off? I'm in a slideshow, Charlie. How do I turn off? Oh, oh, I got it. Stop playing narrations. Got it. Okay. All right. So let's try this again. Okay. So it's, so now let me see if I can uh, turn on the, the laser pointer. And I knew I should have put some music on for background on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mike, you're talking about this end of the curve. Is that correct? You need to share it, Rudy. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, let me let me share the app. Got to get everything coordinated and in sequence here. All right, and let me go to full screen mode. Okay. All right. So everybody should be seeing that now. And let me turn on the laser pointer. All right. So let's see, how come, oh, wait a minute. Hang on a second. You're only seeing, Charlie, are you only seeing the uh, preview screen? You're not seeing it in full screen mode? That's affirmative. You don't have it set for play from beginning or well, you don't need to play. You need to play from current slide. Yeah, yeah, you can just on. go up screen. There you go. Yeah, no, I think you can hit uh, no, I think it's the sharing thing. I was sharing, I was sharing the wrong screen. Um, let's see. I think screen one, screen two. Yeah, let me try this. I think this will work better. Okay, now just go up to the go up one. You there have a go. winner. There we go. Okay, we got it, folks. All right, let me turn on my laser pointer. And let's talk about this. So, Mike, you're talking about the uh, this end of, for example, an end fed half wave antenna. And we're talking about 2000 plus ohms over here. Right, Mike? You understand? 
Yes. So this is what you're asking about. And you're asking if, if uh, trying to feed an NFED half wave like this is going to create a lot of heat. That was your question? Yes. Okay. So the first thing you have to realize is uh, you've got a 50 ohm coax that you're feeding this with, and it's going into a very high impedance. All right. And impedance, just so you know, is simply the instantaneous resistance plus any uh, what's called reactance, okay, which is, affects resonance, a reactance. And that's the plus or minus J value. But uh, so there's a real resistance and there's an imaginary part, which is the reactance of so the uh, inductive or capacitive reactance. So if it's just a pure resistance of 2450 ohms, you need a typically a 49 to one balance, because guess what? If you divide 2450 by 50, you'd get 49. And this is why people use 49 to one balance at by N feeding an N fed half wave antenna. If you've done a good job matching it up, then you will find that um, it's pretty efficient and very little of the, your energy will be heat. Most of it will be radiated into the atmosphere. Now I'll tell you one important thing here. This is true uh, <clears throat> only for that particular frequency or band or wavelength. So for example, if you're measuring 2450 ohms at 40 meters at the end, it can be something considerably different on 20 meters or 15 or 10 meters. It could be, you know, 1500, it could be 3000. It, it'll on the average be somewhere around a couple thousand ohms on the end. All right, especially if it's a at least a 40 meter cut uh, antenna length. And so when you are not operating, uh, if you're at, let's say, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 meters, and it's been cut to 40 meters, and it, the NFED is not giving you, presenting you 2450 at that frequency at 20 meters or above, then uh, are you going to change balance? Probably not, because it's close enough, you'll probably be within two or three to one SWR. And guess what? The rest of that will go into heat. That will be lossy. The power's got to go somewhere. If it doesn't go into the air, it, it is radiated as heat instead of radiated as radio waves. Does that make sense, Mike? Yes, it does. Thank you. Great. Okay. Charlie, do we have any other questions? Okay, there you go. Um, we have got a question from Craig, KL7H, and uh, he gave it to us in, in chat, but I'm going to let Craig go ahead and ask you the question directly, since he has his hands raised. Anyway, go ahead, Craig. Thank you, uh, Charlie, and uh, Rudy, good to hear you on. No, I was actually uh, just making a statement back when you were uh, uh, defining Q or sharpness uh, in a tuned circuit, either uh, in series or parallel, uh, the, uh, you, of course, you can make a circuit tuned to a given frequency with most any combination of capacitive and reactive inductance, and you can affect the sharpness of the circuit by predominating on the capacitive side. So that is a way by varying those factors of broadening or sharpening uh, uh, the particular circuit. In fact, many Q multipliers work on that sort of thing. Would you agree, Rudy? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I appreciate that. Great. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into some of this in the future episodes, actually, when we come to, uh, tuners and LC circuits and resonance, and, um, we'll see it on nano VNAs. We'll see all kinds of stuff. Um, not sure why my screen is suddenly deciding to go forward or backward. Um, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, um, so yeah, it, David, it, it comes back to, tuned circuits. <clears throat> An antenna is a tuned circuit. An LC tank circuit is a tuned circuit. Um, a receiver front end is a tuned circuit. There's many, many tuned circuits in electronics, in the mechanical world, and in, in other worlds as well. Now, I was also going to tell you, I had an interesting uh, uh, experiment, if you will, uh, living up in Alaska. 
uh, we have problems with ravens getting on the uh, antenna wires. And of course, they're big, heavy birds and, uh, and they haven't been housebroken. There's a lot of reasons that you don't want ravens perched on your antenna. So the right. uh, experiment was, well, if I run a lot of power, uh, can I possibly uh, get rid of the ravens? And uh, on a resonant uh, dipole, an HF, no, it doesn't work at all because the difference between where one foot grips the antenna versus where the other foot grips the antenna, the voltage and the current are very similar, so the raven never detects the difference. Well, the solution to that was I uh, took my VHF amplifier, I had a Tempo 6 and 2, uh, and I ran about 1,000 watts of 2-meter RF into it. You want to do this with a tube amp, not with a solid state, or you'll blow it up. And uh, the uh, reactance was so bad, and the frequency uh, uh, difference from one spot to the other was so short that the, uh, the raven immediately uh, got the message and departed with a... Uh, uh, with a burst of smoke and flame and didn't come back. So uh, that's, a, that's a very vivid example of how to deal with uh, uh, increasing your reactants from one spot to another on the antenna. Cool. Well, I think that would work. Very good, Rudy. I've got another question here from Ron real quick before we go over to uh, Steve, who's got his hand raised. But uh, Mr. Bursky said, what about coax characteristics in the loss versus SWR chart? Coax characteristics for the loss in the SWR chart. Uh, I'm, can you can you help me out further clarify that? I'm not sure I understand. Mr. Bursky, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and please discuss that with Mr. Wiedemann. Yeah, hi, hi Rudy. I was just uh, looking at at your uh, your chart where you plot. You had a bunch of uh, figure, <coughs> excuse me, figures for. The amount of loss you get at various SWRs. Oh, okay. Let me bring that up real quick. I know. I now know what you're talking about. Effective SWR on efficiency. Yeah, SWR versus loss or loss versus right. SWR. Yep. Let so me... my my question is, uh, what part does the coax characteristics play in, in those in those figures? I mean, if you have really lossy coax, is it is a high SWR gonna are you gonna be penalized more for a high SWR if you have really crappy coax? You know, I'm I'm glad you asked that question. It's a really good question. And uh let me let me try to maximize this screen here and see if that works. There we go. Can you see that? No, yeah. I guess you're yeah you're seeing the the preview. Anyway, um, I'll get used to this. I, I've got three screens going here, so you have to forgive me keeping track of which one. Um, so the the short answer is you have to think of your antenna as a system. That includes the rig, the the feed line, any uh, tuners, mm -hmm. balance, co uh, chokes, the antenna itself. Okay, and the effect of any ground that are connected to the antenna or surrounding that antenna. It really becomes part of the entire system. So if your coax is lost, well, you can also think of it as a chain, all right? Um, because if your rig is a very inefficient turning DC power into RF, then there's loss, right? If your rig says, I'm putting out 100 watts, then you do kind of an audit, you say, all right, you put a you put a power meter at the antenna and you go, I'm feeding the antenna, but it's only getting 50 watts into the antenna. Where's the rest of it going? Well, guess what? If you've got a tuner in the system in between, some of it's going there. Some of it's probably being lost by the coax. Some of it's being lost. Ah, this is <laughs> switching on me. Um, some of it's being lost uh, by... Um, uh, yeah, the could be eh, not so much the balance and chokes are not going to lose a lot, but tuners, uh, coax, and uh, and and other things like moisture on your coax, okay, um, and the proximity of your coax to other things like grounds. If you don't have a common mode choke where the feed line meets the antenna, then your coax is part of the antenna. And if you got that running along the ground and it's raining out, that could very much uh, uh, create a loss path of RF energy from that coax into the ground and not into your antenna and into the air. Does that make sense? Did that help? 
Yeah, that helps. That helps a lot, Rudy. Thank you. Great. More okay, time. Rudy, the next uh, person that's got their hand up is Mr. Steve Lomas, K7EAU. Steve, what is your question? Okay, Rudy, I'm uh, sort of hungry tonight. I wonder if you could show that picture of the buffet, but uh, show the dessert section there. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, actually, I did have a question here. Uh, I just something that I wonder if you could just elaborate on this, because just reading the sentence itself, you know, right at the be beginning, you say, impedance converts voltage waves into current waves. I wonder if you just elaborate on that a bit. All right, well, that's, you know, that is a, that's a very good question, Steve, um, because it, it was meant to kind of uh, really trigger your thoughts. And it obviously uh, uh, made the trip and got into your, uh, into your brain. Basically, when, the transmitter transmits a signal down the coax, all right? That signal is, it impresses a voltage onto the coax. That coax has a certain resistance of 50 ohms at typical range of frequencies we operate at, HF three through 30. Because it has that, that ohmage, okay? And hopefully little reactance to it because you don't want it detuning things. It's, it was designed to have a pretty low uh, uh, J value or what we call reactance value. So it's purely resistance at that frequency. So that, because it has resistance, that impressed voltage will, will result in a certain current at RF frequencies, all right? That is then transferred to the antenna at the feed point. So now you are impressing that voltage onto the antenna wire. And now the antenna is no longer acting like a coax, it's acting like a radiator, all right? And now that voltage, uh, and let me bring up the, uh, the slide you're probably thinking of. It's the one, it's the antenna one. Hang on a second. Let me bring that up for you. I think this will help clarify things. And let's see, screen one, let's, yeah. Okay, let's take a look at this slide. The, um, let me, if you notice the blue is the current and the red is the voltage. So what happens is, Think of the feed line impressing a voltage wave that's sloshing back and forth, just like the, the tub example in the, in the presentation. That voltage wave is sloshing back and forth. Because the antenna itself has an impedance at that frequency, hopefully close to 50 ohms, if you've got a good efficient match, then pretty much all of the energy that that voltage has will turn into current through impedance, voltage divided by current is resistance. And if it's purely resonant and there's no J plus minus J value, then it's all resistive and it'll be about 50 ohms at the feed point, center feed point of an ideal dipole. So it's really current that generates the electromagnetic wave, all right? It's not the voltage, it's the current. And where your antenna has the highest current and every different design has current distribution that's different but on a dipole it's in the center that's where the most radiation comes from you know we did an antenna test the other day david and i did uh, on my noodle antenna and we proved that the most signal strength with our signal strength meter uh, several feet away from the antenna of when it was in vertical mode was indeed at the center of the antenna so it was behaving like a classical dipole. So um, th does that kind of help you out, Steve? Yeah, that's a good explanation. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just got one other one. It's just a clarification. I wonder if you could go to where you show the classic antenna system slide. I should be pretty close to that one. Oh, OK. Yeah, it was the previous slide. It's this one. No. No, yes. it, well, not really. No, it's uh, it's the one where you show both the uh, 
from the transmitter end and then from the oh, dipole. Oh, 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 oh I'm antenna. sorry. I have two of them that are called the yeah, same. Yeah, that's the one right there. Now, I guess the question is, you know, like if you say in your presentation, uh, if you, well, my question is if you use a dipole, center fed dipole, and you have a ballon right at the feed point of the antenna, uh, what's the need for a, a current choke? Wow, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, let's talk for a second about balance versus chokes. Balance are typically there to either do two functions, to convert a unbalanced line such as a coax to a balanced antenna such as a dipole. Dipole is equal length on both sides. It has equal uh, resistance on both sides or impedance, and so it's balanced. So you need something that's unbalanced to balanced, okay? And an un, un is if you had an unbalanced antenna, like a vertical, and you wanted to match up a coax to a vertical antenna, and the vertical antenna had an impedance on your nano VNA that was not 50 ohms. It was, I don't know, let's call it uh, 450 ohms. Well, then you would need a nine to one un un because it's a nine to one impedance ratio and you need to go from an unbalanced to an unbalanced, an unbalanced coax to an unbalanced antenna. Now, that's the balance and un and un uns. Let's talk about common mode chokes or common cho uh, 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 current chokes that you see here in orange, yellowish. The, the main purpose, and it's separate from a, a balance, the main purpose of a choke is to isolate your feed line from becoming part of the radiating system of the antenna, okay? Uh, and putting it on the rig end prevents any stray radiation like your power poles around you nearby. Having the coax, the shield on the coax particularly, become a receiving antenna, all right? and interfering with the signal coming in from your real antenna. So you don't want to do that. So you could put a, a current choke at the rig end and it isolates the feed line from local sources of radiation coming into your, your receiver, separate from the antenna being part of, or the coax becoming part of your antenna's radiating system when you're transmitting. So, does that help, Steve? Yeah, I can see the purpose of putting the uh, choke at the rig end because, like you said, uh, you know that uh, coax shield can pick up stuff. But actually, though, if you had, let's say, a center-fed dipole, you know, resonant and all that, and you did have a ball in there, then it wouldn't seem like you'd have to worry about any radiation on the outer shield of the coax because you are going from a, you know, the, the ballon is essentially going from a unbalanced feed line to a balanced antenna. So I wouldn't think you'd have a problem with any radiation on the coax, uh, provided that you had a ballon there uh, at, well, the, at the feed point. In the ideal case, Steve, you're, you're correct. You're, and it would be true in the ideal case, but we don't live in an ideal world with ideal antennas. And so, the if you've got a a, a ballon okay and you've got a balanced antenna and an unbalanced feed line and you're using a ballon for example and for whatever reason at that frequency it isn't a good impedance match all right then you could easily have some current coming down some excess current coming down the outside skin of your coax's um, uh, shield your braid inside that coax. So the, the whole idea is to try to choke that off. That's why it's called a choke, is to choke off any of that stray current uh, from a, an imperfect antenna that is not quite equally matched up on impedance to your feed line. You follow me? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So okay. thank you. Great, let's, let's continue, this is great. Okay, anybody else have their hand up? No, they're getting quiet out there. We need to rile them up. Uh, 
Yeah, and Craig gave a comment, I don't know, uh, at more loss on the coax over the BSR. I think everybody can see that because he sent it to everybody. So if anybody wants to look at look at that from Craig, that's cool, unless he's got some uh, added things to that. Um, uh, KL7H, do you have anything to add to what you put in chat? Well, I just wanted to point that out that uh, uh, sometimes uh, people are fooled by uh, uh, what's happening on one end of the coax versus what's happening on the other based on the quality of the coax that uh, uh, the worse the coax is, the greater the attenuation. Uh, but the appearance uh, is that things are doing really well at the uh, at the station end uh, because they're looking at uh, closer to the characteristic impedance of the antenna, uh, our, uh, the coax, because uh, all the bad stuff at the antenna end end is being masked by the, uh, the poor quality of the coax. So you got to be careful about that. Uh, that's why uh, whenever possible, a balance line is a better way to go than coax because number one, it's a lot cheaper. And number two, uh, the uh, loss is much, much lower, especially on the higher frequency. So if you can go with uh, ladder line or some form of balance line, keep it away from metal between yourself and the uh, antenna, uh, the results will be a lot better. Uh, what do you think? Uh, th that's a great comment, Craig. And let me just add to that. You know, again, you have to remember that the antenna is a system and it's a chain of, of, of processes and impedance matches. And every place you have loss and every place you have impedance mismatch, you're going to have losses and you're going to have heat generated instead of transmitted power to your antenna. So, you know, when, you're in, when your rig says 100 watts out, you're not putting 100 watts onto the antenna. You almost never are. Uh, I've never seen a system that really puts out exactly that same amount. There's always some kind of losses in the system. And the idea here is to minimize that on multiple bands. And that's when it gets starts to get a little bit tricky. But um, uh, while we're on the subject of uh, antenna in terms of the uh, radiating uh, efficiency versus the receiving efficiency, there's something I wanted to, to mention, something I've looked into recently, and that is you probably have heard of the, term, the concept of reciprocity, right? That an ideal antenna will be as good a transmitting device as it is a receiving device. And that's great if you have a full length cut antenna and it's resonant. The problem is very often when you change bands, it's not perfectly cut and it's not perfectly resonant, okay? Uh, I'll give you a really good practical example. Mobile rigs, shortened antennas, um, you know, ham sticks, uh, screwdriver antennas, whatever. When the antenna is shortened, but it's tuned up to be resonant with some kind of a loading system, typically a loading coil, then it can be made to be a pretty reasonably efficient transmitting device and it gets the signal out into the air. The problem, though, is on the receive side. If you think about it, you have shorter antenna. And back to Steve's question about uh, uh, voltage versus current, electromagnetic waves, when they're coming into your receiver, is volts per meter, OK? The strength of that signal is volts per meter. And by meter, I mean length of the receiving wire. The longer the wire, which is why everybody says long wire, for shortwave listening, the longer the wire, the more volts you're going to be capturing because the more meters you got up in the air. And if you've got a clear of, of uh, grounds and, and uh, blockages and reflections, then it's going to see the maximum amount. And it's that's called the antenna's aperture. You may have heard of it, just like the aperture in a camera's lens. And so the bigger that is, the longer that antenna is, the more volts it'll capture, and therefore the signal strength will be stronger, hopefully relative to the other sources of noise. And so I just want to point out to everybody that there, you may not be getting as good a receiver or signal incoming signal strength as you really could have at that location if you've got a compromised short transmitting antenna. It's a very subtle but important concept and I'm actually following up on that. I'm putting together a separate SDR receiver end on my system to be able to test that out and prove it to myself that on compromised antennas, uh, you can improve the receive side with a separate long wire antenna. Sorry, I was a little bit long-winded, but 
I, I wanted to make that point because I think it's an important one. Very so, good, Rudy. Excellent. Um, and long-winded? Oh, we would never say that of you, Rudy. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Anyway, um, so uh, Steve's got his hands raised again. K7EAU, go ahead. Okay, Rudy. Uh, this is in the area of transmitting antennas. And I think on your chart there, I don't know if you can bring that up. It, it says uh, uniform current distribution across antenna if ah. possible. Um, if you could, yeah, uh, general guidelines are, uh, where is that? Uh, yeah, uh, so where I'm glad you brought that up, Steve. Um, yeah. Cause I, the way I see it, uh, you know, I could see like a mag loop antenna. There, the current, from what I remember, and I haven't looked into this for a while with a mag loop, the current, because it is so such a small part of the wavelength that it, the current is uniform on a loop, mag loop. But, and then I think, you know, like I use a uh, capacitive top hat on my 10 meter vertical, and that will cause a redistribution of current. But in most cases with almost all antennas, you don't have that uniform current distribution. Do you, it seems like? Okay, so um, that's, a, that's a good point. The, um, there are a lot of ways to, to put antennas up and sometimes you need to bend them around at different angles, okay? Here's my, my bigger point is that yes, you can do, put capacity hats and change the loading. L let me first talk about changing the load point. You've heard that people say that on on a vertical antenna, it's better to have the load point at the center of the antenna or close to the center of the antenna than at the bottom, okay? It's more convenient at the bottom because that's the easiest place to hook up your coax, which is why most people do it there. But technically, if you can put the load point in the center, okay, since an inductor, if you're using an inductive coil, which most of the time you are, an inductor is a current-driven device, not a voltage-driven device, then the... Uh, current there will actually uh, tend to be more effective and it'll actually uh, concentrate a certain amount of the radiating current there at that device. And so it'll, it'll tend to spread out. Another example is a capacity hat. A capacity hat will actually shift and move and spread out the current distribution of your antenna uh, and uh, along your antenna. And the higher up you can get, that current distribution, the better. So in reality, if you're sitting uh, between a couple metal buildings, you'd really like to have that thing top loaded because that's where most of the current's gonna be. Uh, and maybe uh, can peak out, that signal can peak out from above the roofs of those uh, metal buildings that you're near. Um, uh, so you think about uh, where it's being loaded and where the currents might be on a uh, on an antenna, and if you're using an NFET half wave and you're running it at high frequency, um, then you've got a lot of lobes or loops of antenna current sitting on that uh, on that long antenna. And if you put bends in the end of it and you get those bends with that current high up in the air, uh, you may actually get a better signal out. Hopefully, that 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 helps you out. Yeah, I guess the only thing is though, with most common antennas, if you're using a dipole, a quarter wave vertical, not doing anything else, but just a standard wire antenna, uh, you're going to have current maximums and current minimums on that antenna. Uh, yes. You're not, that, that's pretty much never going to have a uniform distribution. That's antenna. absolutely true, Steve. So on the classical dipole, there isn't much you can do about moving the current distribution no. on the antenna. It is what no. it is. You're absolutely no. right. But no. I'm saying, we're gonna be exploring a lot of different kinds of antennas and a lot of different weird things you can do with antennas, a lot of tricks you can play to fit them into small spaces, to make them more efficient, uh, to make them mul more multi-banded, uh, to lower the cue uh, on any one of the bands so that we get wider bandwidth on, uh, on a particular band. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of tricks and some of it has to do, if you keep in mind, that you really want to control where that current is and uh, take maximum advantage of it. That was that was the, my point, really. Yeah. Okay. Fine. No, that clarifies that. Thank you, Rudy. Super. 
All right, more questions. Now, don't everybody talk at once or type at once, either way. All right, so while we're waiting, I, as you can imagine, I've got a couple uh, uh, questions to throw at you folks. So let me ask you, if I have a, an antenna system, a black box that my transmitter is transmitting into, and you don't know what that black box is, could be a perfect dipole, could be some other kind of antenna, could be something else, okay? And I've got a perfect SWR 1.0. Dead nuts, nailed it. Does that make a great antenna? Does that by definition mean it's a great antenna? And if not, why not? Anybody? Go ahead and raise your hand or I'll answer for you. But no, Steve, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I keep talking too much here. But uh, all that means is that you have a good impedance match between your transmitter, or, you know, your transceiver, that likes to see 50 ohms and your antenna, I mean, your feed point at that point. Uh, uh, but uh, it all depends, uh, you know, like you could have a quarter wave ground mounted vertical where if you had a super group of radials, that impedance would be actually 36 ohms. So you'd have an uh, SWR of 1.4 to one. So if you took away a lot of those radials, well, great you would be uh, lowering your SWR down to 1.1 to 1, but a lot of that, uh, you know, that it's really not a better system because you now have a greater return loss. So that's what gives you the 50 ohms. You're, you're actually better off with a 1.4 to 1 SWR with that vertical. Okay, well, um, what about- I think it a... might mean you should have a really good dummy load too. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say that was going to be my answer. It means that what's in that box is a dummy load. <laughs> there you go. Somebody got it. Um, it could be a dummy load or it could be an antenna that is is perfectly tuned, but it is it's maybe in a effectively a Faraday cage. I mean, if you're sitting surrounded by metal sheds at some industrial <clears throat> park, OK, and you're in there, your mobile rig and or <laughs> Charlie will appreciate this. If you're inside of an ex exhibition center with metal walls all around, including your roof, you're effectively in a Faraday cage and you are not going to hear anything. You're not going to get any signal in or out of that place, even though you have a perfect, perfectly tuned antenna and all of that energy is being radiated out into the uh, into the expo center. So um, just because you have a great SWR doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting a great signal out or even putting out a signal into the air at all in the first place. So I, I don't want you to be totally dependent on SWR. SWR is, is an indicator, kind of like a doctor takes your temperature. It's one indicator, but it doesn't tell you that you're healthy or not healthy. It might tell you that you're not healthy if you got an SWR of five, but if it's a one, it doesn't mean that by definition you are healthy. It just means that you're not unhealthy there, but you may be unhealthy in some other aspect of your antenna system. So more questions or more comments. I mean, we're, we're gonna throw it open. This is a buffet. And so uh, I'm going to just open it up. Yeah, uh, Mr. Bursky has a question that I think I can answer. Um, it was uh, he tried to print from Rudy's video when paused, but couldn't figure out how to do that. Is there a way to do that? Actually, Mr. Bursky, there is no way to do that on YouTube. YouTube protects their videos so that you can't do it. But if you did pause the video on a slide, there is actually a way to get a picture of that. And that is actually doing what is called a screen snap. And you do that through your, uh, say, Windows or something like that. They would have how to do a snap of the screen. And that hey, would Charlie, be what you're seeing. And everything. Charlie, it's actually called print screen. Yeah, or print. Well, right. print screen might not do it because print screen is a whole different function within the operating system. Well, yeah. Let me what, just, they need, yeah. what you really need to do is do the uh, screen snap or snap screen. Okay. And screen that screen. sometimes is a separate little free application that you can get. But that is, that is outside. You can't do it within uh, YouTube. 
uh, but you can do it with your computer. Since you did put him on, on pause, you've got that, that on your window, and then you just need to do a snap of that window. And yeah, that and is a little bit more complex. Uh, what I do is on Windows, I press the Windows key and hold it down, and then press the print screen button. That's usually F11 on the top, uh, top row. And you'll, screen, you'll see the screen go black for a second. Yeah. and then come back and it captures it and puts it into your pictures uh screen captures folder in pictures and windows i know windows i don't know how it works on a mac so that is a way to to do it is to freeze the uh, youtube uh, you can put the youtube in full screen mode freeze it and then uh, and do a screen capture yeah on a windows computer you can also hit the windows button the shift key and the s key that that captures it and then you can put it into word or anything else okay good to know great so more questions more questions comments um suggestions on what you'd like to see more about what you'd like me to what material you'd like me to put some uh stuff together on yeah this is craig again i was going to comment uh, uh on what you touched on the difference between a receive antenna and a transmit antenna. We uh, instinctively think that they're reciprocals of each other, that whatever goes out one way comes back the other. But as you uh, pointed out, you had the uh, volts per meter or uh, capture area. There's a lot of different ways to put it. I, I have a, a good friend, uh, Kel 6 m who runs a massive moon bounce station. So he has a, a huge uh, dish antenna, about a 35 footer. And of course, he's always talking about uh, capture efficiency. And uh, this is literally uh, what uh, these people have to work on is getting the maximum amount of hardware in the air or in the way of the received signal coming in uh, to try to pick up the signal. And this goes on any spectrum, whether you're talking about uh, Hubble or James Webb or anything else, uh, uh, you want the maximum amount of uh, capability to receive the signal. And uh, resonance doesn't have a whole lot to do with it because, of course, uh, in the case of the dish antenna, uh, the surface is non-resonant. It's just a parabola. And what goes on with the, uh, uh, with the resonant part is that the uh, feed horn or the, uh, uh, the capture uh, elements that go into the preamp and on down into the uh, station. So uh, I think there is a big difference that people don't realize between transmitting and receiving as far as antenna design or capability is, uh, is implied. <laughs> Okay, that, that's a great comment. And uh, it's a good example of uh, trying to maximize your aperture for your received signal on like a satellite. Okay, great. Excellent. Um, we are just about at the end of our hour and I don't see any new questions coming in or hands raised. Everybody probably got hungry from looking at your buffet picture, uh, Rudy. So they'll wanna go out and get their cheese and crackers. Um, or as I know, uh, Steve, he's going to look for some sort of brewski uh, that we can <laughs> in Thailand. I know I'm thinking about that anyway. Uh, so um, I just want to say thank you very much. And uh, Rudy, if you could tell us what the next, um, in fact, actually, I think I have a slide here. I'm going to go ahead and bring that up for you um, and share that out real quick uh, for the next. Woo. I'm glad to see I'm not the only one with technical. Oh, yeah. No, I was uh, using the microphone and my spacebar key. So I was driving this little function um, crazy here. And uh, now I can do it from current slide and bring that up and have it all fine. Um, yeah, I that's that's the, the thing about it is if you use too many keys. Let, to I've, do got, something. I've got the slide queued up. Let me just let me share it. Just okay, hang on. I will go ahead and drop down. You've got it queued up. Go for it. Yeah. So let me go ahead and share that slide. Almost. <laughs> you get. <laughs> okay. I think you guys are seeing this. No, you've got the wrong slide up. Oh, you want? Because I'm. Yeah, I'm... you're on. You're on the wrong PowerPoint. Oh. Unless well, you want to just move the slide to the next podcast, which is getting. Yeah. Hold on. 
Uh, so let's see, that's screen one. That's, I thought I hooked it up to the PowerPoint one here. Hold on. Are you seeing that? Yeah, but you got the wrong one up. Uh, Rudy, go ahead and stop that share. I'll bring it up. Okay. Yeah, there that you had it close, but um, there you go. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, well, we were talking about the, the two different slides, Charlie. No problem. Let, well, let's talk about the very next podcast. I have a list of, of all the planned podcasts to kind of wet your whistle and uh, get you guys uh, interested. But uh, very briefly, the next podcast that I'm going to put on YouTube this month is on getting heard. Now, what the heck does that mean, all right? That means how do I get a signal out? How do I get the signal in, okay? And how do I get the, the most legibility or signal quality transmitted across that, that system, all right? And believe it or not, as I dig into it, uh, there's a lot of factors. We'll talk about propagation, that's a big factor. We'll talk about um, trying to maximize both the receive and the transmitted signals and trying to maximize your propagation, especially if it's point to point. We did a test last night, David, K7FAN and I, on point to point propagation of VHF and 10 meter uh, sideband, uh, straight line of sight. And um, they both ended up being about, uh, I think it was about 15 or 20 miles that we could get before things got pretty uh, unintelligible. So that's what I mean by uh, getting heard. Uh, we'll talk about modulation, we'll talk about um, equalization, we'll talk about different ways that you can compress more uh, data into your uh, RF signal so it's more intelligible, a few tricks like that. It's not strictly an antenna subject, but it's related because it has to do with maximizing your signal uh, that's conveyed across the air and received by the other person and vice versa. Uh, so very good. Let, Excellent, Rudy. Uh, Thank you very much. In yeah. fact, uh, we are at the top of the hour now. And okay. um, uh, let me so see if, if you I can get guys, if yeah. you want, uh, you want to stop now or do, would you like to see some of the future podcasts that are? Uh, Rudy, I think we're going to leave that because uh, this is in being recorded and we do have a 60 minute limit. Oh, OK, okay. Very, good, very good. And uh, so just to remind everybody that uh, Tenet Talk, uh, Rudy will have the next presentation up at um, YouTube uh, in the next uh, few weeks. And we uh, will again have this uh, Zoom meeting uh, regularly scheduled. And I will send out a reminder to everybody. So if anybody forgets what it is uh, and when it is, I will make sure that you are reminded. So on that note, I want to say thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, K7RAW, the Antenna Whisperer, has done a fantastic job tonight. And I want to say thank you to that. And to everybody out there, 73. All right, guys. Thanks so much. And thanks for your patience on our uh, on some of our technical issues. I'm sure we'll get better as we go forward. Have a great night. 73. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.